So again, welcome to uh, this part of the service where we have our the sermon and we stop and ponder the words of God that he so lovingly uh, shares with us and instructs us and guides us and molds us because his word is truth. And the, the title of today's sermon will be Embracing Jesus Today with the Hope of Eternity. And the, the scripture reading will be done by Ann Cumbin from Matthew 28, 1 to 10 from the ESV. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And as, as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. These inspired words are the foundation of our Christian hope. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the sure hope of an eternal future with you. Amen. Amen. You know, if Jesus was not resurrected, then the following words would be true. You know, atheists do not accept that there is an afterlife, so do not have a future in it to fear. And the atheist feels death as a full stop. They see death as a full stop. So it is the process of dying that matters. So they have absolutely no hope. And all that they have to expect is a life of nothingness. Because if Jesus has not risen, they are right that nothing else exists after death. So they would be right that what is important is the process of death. But of course, we know that that is not true. But it's not a new thing that this unbelief, because not believing in the resurrection was is something that even the apostle paul had to deal with with some people in the church as we read in in the next scripture in second corinthians 15 or in first corinthians 15 he says in verse 12 now if if christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead and remember he's writing to the church but if there's no resurrection of the dead then not even christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is, is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, we are all, we are of all people most to be pitied. So Paul is very clear again that if Christ is not risen, then those who have died have perished. There is no hope for them. And during today's sermon, we're going to consider the excellent news that Jesus has vanquished sin and death and all sources of evil. 
is victorious over them all. And one day there will be no more. Jesus is now alive and reigning as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this fact that Jesus is, is alive is not a fairy tale. It's the truth. The resurrection of Jesus is not a story invented by men. Because the reality of the resurrection is revealed by God himself. And of course, those who do not believe are often trapped in scientific reasoning. Because according to the scientific mind, uh, they think that everything is governed by, by the inflexible laws of nature, like gravity, like the other laws of nature. And they think there is a physical and human explanation for everything that we see. And even if we don't know it, they think that in time we'll discover the physical explanation for what they cannot explain right now. And certainly they do not think that God is the creator who exists outside of time. They do not believe that God can enter time and our world and yet be different from it. And being trapped in this mode of thinking, the resurrection from the dead to them is impossible. It's not conceivable. And although we realize that we cannot convict people by historical facts that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, because many people have read the historical uh, fact that Jesus is alive, but still they do not believe. In fact, the only way to come to faith is for the Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts to this reality. But it's good to review the fact because God works in, in various ways. And I, I read some books where people came to faith because they looked at the fact of the resurrection and they came to the point where they could not refute uh, this fact of the resurrection of Jesus. But some, um, you know, just, it doesn't matter. They still don't believe and they don't believe that Jesus is the eternal son of God made flesh. So let's quickly look at some facts that everyone agrees. That uh, everyone who looks at the Bible agrees because most people agree that Jesus existed. They see him as a great teacher or, but everyone agrees that Jesus died, that Jesus was dead that and 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 most serious scholars do not dispute that fact and we because of jesus because of jesus death all the disciples had lost hope and 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 so because we read that in acts 1 6 in acts 1 6 we read so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Even if that after they had met Jesus, after they had seen him living, you know, because they were in the Jewish, in the Jewish mind, they were expecting that the Messiah would establish his kingdom right away. And so they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And we see that when they saw Jesus, when the disciples realized that Jesus was alive, although they had a misperception of when he would establish his kingdom, their discouragement and despondency, despondency were changed to joy. And we read about that in John 20 and verse 20. We read... Um, And, and after he said this, he showed them his hand and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So it just changed their whole perspective about life, about where they stood, about the reality of that Jesus really did what he said, what he that he that that he did what he said, that he was resurrected. They just rejoiced. 
And all the four gospel writers agreed the tomb where Jesus was in tomb and buried was empty. Now, as we look at the gospel, you will see that the four gospel writers have a different, they describe the, the, the empty tomb and everything else as in somewhat different way. But that does not take away from the truth because witnesses, when, when witnesses look at the facts, they see it in their own perspective. They see it differently, but the fact remain the facts. And, and the bottom line is that the tomb where Jesus had been buried was empty. They all agree on that. And even unbelieving scholars believe that the disciples were convinced of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And because it's uh, the resurrection of Jesus is not the, 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 the is not the result of faith. Faith is the result of the resurrection. They did not make this up. The resurrection created their faith, and it created it creates our faith as well. An actual event occurred which caused the disciples to believe. If the disciples had made up this story of the resurrection, they would not have chosen the fact that the first witness, the first witnesses that Jesus met were women, because in the Jewish culture at that time, women's testimony about facts were not even considered. And even the disciples, when the, the two women, the, the women came to the disciples and told them that Jesus was raised, they doubted the women. They had to go see for themselves. So when we look at the whole event, the, the fact that Jesus has res was resurrected and living is confirmed by his numerous appearances to many. At one time, he appeared to 500 people. As, you, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And the importance of the resurrection is also evident in the apostles preaching at Pentecost. If you read that, they do not go over the life of Jesus. They do not go over his birth. They do not go over the various miracles that he, he performed. No, they focused on what? They focused on the resurrection. And we see that in, in, in Peter's preaching in Acts 2, 22 to 24. Men of Israel, he says, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your mind, in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, because he, it was not possible for him to be held by it. So they preached about who? They preached about the risen Christ. In Acts 2.36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Again, they preached about the resurrected Christ. The Christ who did not say in the tomb. The Christ who is alive. And the resurrection of Jesus is not a restoration to physical life. It's the emergence of a brand new order of life. As uh, uh, Lamb says in his book, uh, on, on, the, on the theology of the resurrection. Because he was raised to a brand new life. And the resur in the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus is the beginning of a new era of God's plan of salvation. It's a continuation, but there's a major change. There's a major shift that occurs here. Jesus had to die in our place. 
sin, death, and evil had no hold on him. He had paid the penalty of sin, which is eternal death for us all. He, he, he had to out of choice, and he did it out of love. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead carries immense and huge significance for all of humanity. And we saw that in previous sermons, how the in Jesus Christ, all of humanity uh, has been, the identity has been changed. And, and we come to have eternal life through faith in what Jesus did for us. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus was different from a physical resuscitation like that of Lazarus or the resurrection of the man from Nain in Luke 7, 11 to 15. So Lazarus died. He was raised to a physical life. He died again. The resurrection, the resurrected body of Jesus, while still a man, it was a bodily re resurrection had different, new, and never seen powers. His resurrected body was different from the body that he had that he had before his crucifixion. And he was not he was not some kind of disembodied man. He was not a ghostly spirit, because he ate with his disciples. They touched him. He appeared to them while they were hiding behind locked doors for fear of being arrested. He was able to go through walls. He appeared and vanished at will. And, and we read about that in Luke 24, 31 with the disciples of Emmaus. And they heard him. He, he spoke with them in a, human, in a human voice. He conversed with them. He had a conversation with him. They could hear him. He was physically visible. And it's interesting that the tomb, the stone at the tomb was removed by an angel after the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus did not have to have the stone removed for him to be raised. The stone was removed not because Jesus needed it removed, but it was for the sake of the disciples. They were able to witness that the tomb was indeed empty, as we read in Matthew 28. And Jesus is the reason that this life, with all of its up and down, up and down is worth living. He is the reason because he is alive. And when we, as we live our life, as we live our Christian life in the faith, we can focus our thoughts, our eyes in three different places. And there's a healthy way of doing it. We can look at the past. Jesus gave us a way to look at the present. And Jesus gave us a way to look at the future. So Jesus gave us a way to look at the past, to look at the present, and to look at the future. Because Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so what we have is we have the crucifixion. We have the resurrection of Jesus. And then we have Jesus' return. And the good news is the past is redeemed. At the cross... All the past, all of our past is redeemed. And we are now to look to Jesus who is alive. And we are to look at Jesus in the hope of the resurrection. And Jesus holds the past, the present, and the future. Because Jesus is the creator of time. He sustains everything. And we can ask, well, where is God's focus right now? That is a good question to ask, isn't it? Because Jesus is working with his people right now, presently. He's working with us right now in the present. He is alive. He sustains the past. 
but he works in the present time with people on earth through the Holy Spirit. And he is bringing forth the wonderful plan of, of salvation of God. And in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, again, Jesus has redeemed everything. So when we look at the past, at our past, at the past of the world, at the past of history, we look to the cross. That's what we do when we have communion. We look back to the cross. Because our past and the past of humanity has been redeemed. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5 and, and other places. So when we look back at the cross, where humanity has been redeemed, it puts everything into perspective. We remember the past, looking at the cross, but our everyday focus is on life, on our life with Jesus now. This is the way of looking back at the past because there is a way of looking back at the past that robs us of the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. And we want to avoid those pitfalls. There's a healthy way of looking at the past and there's a, uh, there's a way of looking at the past that robs us of joy and peace. The Israelites were a type of all of humanity. You know, they were delivered from the horrible slavery under the Egyptian brutal rulership. And we read that in Genesis. It was horrible what they lived through. And God miraculously rescued them from this slavery and he guided them to the promised land as he had promised. And as they were walking to the promised land, they were not satisfied with God's provision and with God's way of guiding them. Instead of being thankful for the work God was doing in their life and the direction they were going, they looked to the past. And this is a human proclivity. That is a tendency that we all have. So what did they do? They complained about their situation. And we read that in Numbers eleven forty six. We read, now the rabble or the multitude that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we, would, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlics. But now our strength is dried up. And there is nothing in all but this man ought to look at. You know, God was not working with, in their past. He had already worked in the past. He had delivered them. He was working with them day by day. And he was, as he was leading them to the promised land. But they were not satisfied with the present way of look uh, that God was working with them. So there's a big lesson for us to learn. As God's people, where are we to focus our attention? How are we to look at our past? How are we to look at the present? How are we to look at the future? And the reality is that we are pilgrims on this earth. We are travelers walking towards a wonderful destination. So where do we fix our eyes? Well, the Bible is very clear again it says therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith looking to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God out of love for us. He went through this tremendous suffering willingly. So the Bible tells us clearly where to fix our gaze as we walk on this often very difficult journey on this earth. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus every day. He leads us every day 
He never forsakes us or leaves us, even in the storms of life, because they invariably come. He is, Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He is the one bringing us successfully to port, to our eternal destination. So we need to stay in the ship and trust Jesus because he is alive today. That is what we are celebrating. That is what we are remembering, the resurrection of Jesus, that, and the reality today that Jesus is alive, very much alive. And it's very easy to be distracted in our Christian journey in and with Christ. But the Holy Spirit, but by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is walking with you and I right now. We cannot change our past. But with the help of God, we can accept it for what it is. As beautiful or as difficult as it is. And for all of us, it's a mixture of both, isn't it? You know, there's a quote in a GCI sermon for today that made me think. It said the following. The ladies, talking to the two Marys, the ladies do not know at this point that Jesus has been raised. We are told that they are returning to see the tomb. We can relate to this experience by these two ladies as we sometimes return to our various tombs that have left us grieving. We come to revisit our resentment and anoint our anger, perfuming our pain and using the anointment of bitterness and unforgiveness in the hopes of preserving what was lost. Isn't that well described? Sometimes our tombs are thrust back upon us by no choice of our own. Things happen and we're brought back there. Triggers our memories. In whatever way we find ourselves keeping vigil on past tombs, we find that God has a message for us. And it's a message that is earth shattering. Take note of how the message is set up. Matthew has included some details here that prepare us to sit up and listen. The message that the angel is going to deliver comes with some extraordinary buildup. First, there's the great earthquake that occurs because the angels of the Lord is descending from heaven. Whatever is about to be shared with these two women is introduced as a message that will shake up the world. Maybe we have not personally experienced being in a literal earthquake, but I'm sure many of us have experienced times in our lives when it seems that the world was being shaken and tossed about. We may often attribute this shake up as being initiated from the, some person, group, or nation, pulling strings and pushing buttons. But another picture emerges here. It's not the inbreaking of the kingdom that shakes. Is it not the inbreaking of the kingdom that shakes the world to its core? Is not God's word the most disruptive force that invades our physical life, our physical domain? And this is a quote from, from GCI. So God is working with us today. And we are to first seek his kingdom every day and deal with each day as they come. Isn't that what God teaching us? Seek first the kingdom of God every day and we can ask as we think about these things and we can reflect what tomb am i keeping in my life what tomb do we keep in our lives and we all have some maybe it's the loss of loved ones through death or or, or other reasons and of course grieving and mourning are normal processes but with god's help and God's healing, in time, we can move on. And as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. We have hope. We grieve, but we grieve in hope. We all have broken dreams and expectations. We can grieve the old days and stay so focused on them that we resist God's increased revelation of himself. 
and we're frozen back in time, not wanting to move and hurting our relationship with the risen Lord. We have that history. When God calls out of this world and out of false religion and brings us to himself, we leave things behind. We're not to stay there. We're to move on with Jesus. <clears throat> we can ask God to reveal to us the tombs that we need to, that we, <clears throat> to reveal to us the, the tombs that we tend to be, go back to. And again, for some in the church, it's a longing for the holy days of old. For others, it shatters dreams and hopes. For others, it may be the loss of relationships. Still for others, it may be disappointing careers, the loss of jobs, profound hurt and disappointment, which we have difficulty forgiving. And the list goes on and on and on. So we can ask God for the strength to move forward in the good fight of faith. And he'll help us. He'll answer our prayers. So let us ask God for help to accept the tombs in our life for what they are for what they were, and with his help to just leave the tombs behind. That is not our focus. Our focus is on Jesus working with us today, dealing with us today, healing us from the pains of past because it's all been redeemed. It's all been redeemed in Christ. And as we read in Matthew 28, Mary Magdalene and the other, Mary did not stay at the tomb. They looked at the tomb and saw it empty. So let us read again what happened. But the angel said to, to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. So he invites them to see the empty tombs. We, we don't deny the empty tombs. But the empty tomb was empty. The tomb was empty, and they were not to linger there, and they did not. Then go quickly, they were told, and tell his then then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen, risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you so. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. So what do we see the, the women doing? Well, they responded very quickly. They obeyed quickly. They walked into the direct in the direction where the Messiah was, there the, where the Messiah would be. And of course, they had mixed emotions. They had fear and great joy. But their joy overshadowed their fears. They ran to tell the disciples and they ran to share the good news of the resurrected Christ. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Again, they met Jesus as they were told. The angels told them, Go. And so they met Jesus. The women recognize his voice and they fell on their knees. They took hold of his feet. They worshiped the risen Lord who is both God and perfectly man. And Jesus knew they were afraid, so he reassured them and told them to set aside their fears. He told them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It applies to us, doesn't it? And he told them, continue your journey and go and tell your brothers. My brothers, he says. The disciples of Jesus, the good news. And he, they were told where to go exactly, to Galilee. And there Jesus would meet them. Again, they trusted their Lord and did what he said in the obedience of faith. They continued on their journey of faith. And when they told the disciples, of course, 
the disciples did not believe us at, at, at first because it was such an un unbelievable story from their point of view. And they ran. And when they all saw Jesus, they believed. They responded, the women responded to Jesus minute by minute in the present with an eye to the future. We too are living today, looking forward to a glorious future. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Jesus said to him in John 20, 20, 29, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This applies to us. We have not seen Jesus with our naked eyes, with our physical eyes, but we believe. And what Paul told the Philippians is a glorious, glorious future. And we are blessed because we have been given the faith to believe that Jesus is risen. We embrace the living Jesus today, looking forward to a better restored world when he returns. So let us rejoice as we receive the love, the joy, and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is alive, life is really worth living. And we will sing about that in the last hymn. Our destination, united to the risen Christ, is beyond our human imagination. When we get to the destination, the problems we experience in this life will then be minimal. There's, it won't, they won't be comparable because what is expect, what, what, we, what is awaiting us is beyond our imagination. And we can taste it, but we cannot fully, but we cannot fully imagine it, so great it will be, because it's a walk of faith. Amen.